talk about just kind of like training theory first, and then if he starts interrupting, I'll have to cut ahead to kind of talk about punishment some. Okay. Um, and that's kind of, you already saw me squirt him with the water bottle, so that's, to us, right, this is punishment. There's, it's, it's me applying some kind of consequence to him that serves no purpose other than telling him what you did immediately prior to this, stop it, yeah. right? Every time you do this, something bad is gonna happen to you, right? Um, so we'll, we'll kind of stop uh, when he interrupts us to address that. Stuff. So when we're talking about why dogs do stuff, right? The, I'm gonna kind of write some notes here uh, while we're working on this, right? So dogs are generally doing things to better their situation, right? Improve their circumstances. And that really comes down to two things. I'm trying to restore comfort if I don't currently have it in some form, or I'm trying to access a reward that I value right so we put him over here he's hooked up to this tether he can't get to you he's making all these exclamations i think because he thinks that that's going to get him out of the scenario that he's in and so what happens a lot of times when dogs behave like this is they do that and then we look at them and so that's already reinforcement right so step one before i get you to release me from this prison that i'm currently in is I gotta get your attention. And so if he's done that, then he feels like he's a step in the right direction, right? To what he's looking to have happen. This is why we had him hooked up on this stake out behind you, and then I have you sitting in front of him and not looking at him, right? So in a nutshell, that's why stuff happens, right? And then when we look at sequence of events that are occurring from a training perspective, this is from the dog's point of view, right? So there's some prompt, you hooked me up to this thing over here, right? That made me engage in some action. I'm going to cuss and spit and complain, right? Until I get some outcome that I want, right? And then that forms a memory that tells me how I should behave when I'm prompted in a similar way again, right? So where this gets built, and not, this isn't an accusation on you guys, where this gets built with a lot of my pet dog training clients is they put their dog in a crate, the dog complained about being in a crate. They let the dog out of the crate. The dog goes, this is what I do to get out of this situation, right? So so the first thing we have to kind of articulate to people is this is, it kind of, it ends up turning into like a tough love conversation. It's like, if we, if we already spoiled this in some way, right? I mean, that could be just the dogs invented it on their own or I did something to directly create this problem. Then the solution to it is, do the opposite thing than you, that you did before, right? To try to to try to fix that issue. So he's calming down, right? The other nice thing about when the dogs engage in that sort of activity is that it's very resource intensive, and so they're not going to be able to do that forever. Yeah. So if we can wait them out, then that's often a decent strategy. A lot of times, I don't have the time or the patience to do that. So then we're gonna we're gonna again we're gonna apply some sort of discomfort to the dog to try to make him stop. Which if I don't like water, that's it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And so if I learn that every time I start vocalizing really loudly, I get squirted. And every time I shut up, I don't get squirted. <laughs> then yeah. pretty quickly I'll learn, okay, well, I'm just going to shut up and then I won't get squirted. As long as this matters enough to me, yeah. right? So we're going to have this conversation later when we talk about bird dogs, how there's a lot of stuff we want them to do where they're going to endure some discomfort because the promise of reward is greater than the struggle they're dealing with at that time, sure. right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is... This is in a nutshell, absolutely everything that we're gonna do. When we train dogs in our system, we sort of use uh, two things, right? We're gonna use pressure of some form. Usually that's me pushing or pulling on the dog or their collar. So I'm either like using my hands on them to physically manipulate them, or I'm using their collar to pull or push them in a certain direction. Um, and then the second thing that we'll use is a marker system right with uh where we give them a verbal signal that tells them you did something good or something bad yeah. there right and then we'll follow that with an appropriate consequence right so when we're talking just about i don't like separating obedience and behavior because they're the same thing i'm getting the dog to do something or not do something so all the principles are the same we name people name stuff that way to make themselves feel important <laughs> i think right but it's all the same stuff so when we're dealing with just stop that right then these two things have already happened. So I'm just showing up for the outcome. I'm right. squirting him with water and then letting him form a memory that was like, oh, I was just barking or whining and then I got squirted so I don't like that, right? So I'm gonna change my behavior. 
And we're talking about all of our obedience training and the overwhelming majority of the stuff that we're doing in our hunting training. What, I, what I'm doing is getting the dog to do something, right? And this is a common thing, like dog owners, they, want it, they just tell their dog no a lot and they make their dog stop doing stuff. This is important with every dog, but vitally important with working breeds is that we have to turn everything kind of into a job, right? They can have downtime and they can goof off and play and stuff like that, but then you need to provide them with the right environment for them to do that where you're not having to nag them all the time, right? Yeah. So like running around the backyard, right? You take them out for a run somewhere on public land, right? Hunting, right? You get cut loose, all that kind of stuff is fine. But like just being on that bed, I want to turn that into a job. Right? You, you do this because I pay you when you do it well and you get in trouble. You, you, you're made to be uncomfortable if you stop doing this before I tell you to. Right? So when we put all this stuff together, what our, our, our sequence for obedience training ends up being we apply force. Right? The force is our prompt initially and then we'll change it to a command later. Yeah. Right? And then the dog does the action, whatever action it is we're asking them to do. And then before we just give them an outcome, I'm gonna mark that moment, right? So I say, yes, this functions the same as a clicker, if you're familiar yeah. with clicker training, right? So we're gonna mark and reward. And then that forms the memory for what the dog's gonna do the next time. So that's how we're gonna do this stuff. We call this a dual reinforcement system because applying force that turns off when the dog did the right thing is negative reinforcement. Yeah. I'm removing discomfort when you comply, yeah. right? So this is negative reinforcement. This is positive reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So this is why I say it's dual reinforcement. The reason why I like training like this is because using force at low levels, I'm gonna make you do what I'm telling you to do. It, it gives the dog the right answer before they know what the right answer is. So I think that there's less stress there, except for whatever stress they feel from me applying some kind of force to them, right? And then they do the right thing. And then because it's followed by a reward, the force isn't always just looked at as like, oh, you're making me do stuff, right? Yeah. It's, you're giving me guidance to show me how to get what I want, Yeah. right? And so that kind of tempers, or I, won't, I don't want to use the term desensitize, but it kind of just tempers how they feel about the application of force in training, right? The other thing that this does is it makes sure that I'm, um, I'm reinforcing both ways uh, early on in the process so the dog becomes intimately familiar with those things. Because what a lot of people do is they just do this part. Yeah. And then the dog does something wrong and they come down on them with a correction. And then the dog is like, that came out of nowhere. I don't know what to do with that. And then we see their motivation level kind of just drop, right? Yeah. And so I, I don't care for that, especially with working dogs, right? Because you can have a dog that runs out and points birds like this, but like, that's no good. And it's not even gonna cut it, right? In like NABDA, they, they, the way they evaluate pointing is I cut, right? It's, uh, it, it's intense, right? Convincing, um, unmistakable and productive, right? So if you point like this, that is not intense and that could be mistakable, right? Yeah. You just stop to stand to think for a second, right? So we can't have that. So this is why we have to kind of maintain the style there, right? Lastly, if I only train with force, I have a dog that only works when they know I can make them. So yeah. these are where you have the guys that take their e-collar off and now their dog's like, let me show you something, <laughs> right? And then if we only train with rewards, I have a dog that only works when they feel like it and there's nothing else better to do, mm -hmm. right? Also not good enough, for yeah. them, right? So again, just in the context of the stuff, like through how I met you guys, you have a double marked retrieve when you do utility tests, right? There's a bird here and a bird here. They must get the second bird first. If they go, I wanna get that one, and you don't have a way to say no, do this, then you're screwed, yeah. right? So we wanna make sure that we have ways to explain to them when they're doing the right thing, right? To get them back on track when we need to, and then to tell them, I'm like, I'm affirming your choice, right? That was good what yeah. you just did there. Is that cool, make sense? Yeah. All right, so the way that this is gonna kind of work for most of the training, this will be the first kind of 
obedience behavior we teach him also is to move away from us and get up on um, an elevated surface. All right, so I have this uh, e-collar hooked up to a, a box, so you'll hear it every time I push a button. That would be me applying electrical stimulation yeah. to your dog, right? I call it kennel when I want my dog to get up on something, so I would say kennel. Once all feet are up here, we turn pressure off. Yeah. So I stop tapping the button, and then I'm gonna mark yes. And then I'll give him a piece of food, I'll throw a ball for him, something like that, right? So that's our sequence of events, how we put all this stuff together. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. All right. Just like we have a marker, just like we have a marker for our rewards, I have a marker for punishment, right? So that marker for when I'm gonna reward the dog, is yes. My marker when I'm gonna punish my dog is out. I don't like saying no, because people say no to their dog 10,000 times a day. My background as a trainer, I came up teaching Keeler method of dog training, and that's their word that they use in conjunction with their applied punisher and that sort of training methodology, so it kind of just stuck for me. Yeah. The important thing for you to remember is you can, make, you can use whatever words you want, right? You just, you give them meaning by conditioning them right so we condition them by i say yes and i toss the dog a piece of food say yes toss the dog a piece of food say yes toss the dog a piece of food i do that before i ever use this to mark a behavior i'm just trying to create a connection until i see when i say yes the dog's eyes get big right yeah. like if he's in another room kind of laying down chilling and you say yes he should run into the room that you're in to be like okay where's my money right pay me i know what that means right it's like ringing a dinner bell right so you need to build that in him if you have it already before we can really do too much of this work, right? But you're, I wanna be clear, you're creating that connection before we can apply this to any of the actual training we're trying to do. Likewise, I'll say out and then I squirt my dog in the face with water or the other thing I'll use is a uh, rolled up towel. I set it down somewhere, right? So I'll throw this at the dog and hit him in the head with it. It's just a towel, it's not gonna hurt him, right? But <laughs> They don't like projectiles flying at their face, right? And for dogs that don't care about water, I have to have something that yeah. they hate when it happens, but it is non injurious, right? It's kind of like my criteria for this stuff, right? So what that means is I'll say out and I'll chuck the towel at my dog's head and I'll do that a handful of times until I see when I say out, I get a, like a flinch response that's anticipatory to what they're doing to, to, it's the, it's, it's the, Opposite polarity, but same sort of involuntary response that I see from them when I say yes is probably the best way to say it, right? Yep. Out. Right? So I would say the word, and then I'm going to follow through by squirting him, right? And then we'll do this a number of times until what we'll start seeing is the moment I say that word, he's going to stop doing what he's doing. The important thing to remember is if you mark a behavior, you must administer the consequence 100% of the time. If he does something great and you don't, you ran out of treats or you don't feel like rewarding him, just don't say yes. Right, right. Just tell him he's a good boy. Tell him, okay, he's done working, whatever, do whatever else. But don't say that word. This is a key word that requires something happens afterwards. Same thing with this one. A lot of people will say, I don't even have to squirt him or I don't even have to throw the towel anymore. I just say the word. That's not how that works. Out. And part of the reason why we have him hooked up, aside from some other stuff I'll talk about in a minute, is he can't escape the consequence. Right. Yeah. This is another problem people have. It's like they throw the towel, but they miss, and then they think that was good enough. He didn't experience anything, <laughs> right? He learned he can get out of it. Exactly, right? So we can't have that happen, right? These things need to be valuable to him, and he needs to not be able to avoid them, or nothing, nothing can get in the way of them occurring, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. When we're teaching this work, when we're using pressure, we're mostly going to use leash and collar, and then we'll use e-collar, layer it over that. We'll do this pretty fast, um, but we're going to teach everything with the leash first. And the reason why we do that is because when the leash is attached to the collar, or when I'm pushing and pulling on the dog with my hands, we have to remember that that provides the pressure, but it also provides directional information about which way to move yeah. to resolve that pressure. So if I pull this way and the dog moves that way, then it relaxes, right? 
And so I'm explaining a lot to him using a leash and collar, whereas e collar sit, down, come, yeah, go, first. right? So it feels the same. So I have to make sure I have what we call command discrimination. You understand what I'm saying, right? Uh, objectively and and for sure, right? You understand what I'm saying before it's fair for me to take leashes off and only use e-collar to prompt behavior, yeah. right? All right.